Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Motive to be Productive. I'm Yusuf. And I'm Daria. And today we are delighted to host Tehran, international well-known comedian and actor. So, uh, hi, Tehran. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We were very pleased to host you. What's up? How so you're in San you Francisco, today? Daria? That's what's up. You're in San Francisco? That's what's up, bro. That's what's up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, oh, no, so I'm an OC, but this background looks great. So, like, we were like, let's, you like the let's background. Fix you like the background. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So Yusuf, like, get... Yusuf was like, he doesn't need a background. Yusuf was just in his closet <laughs> and he's taking it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Exactly. That's so, keep it gangster. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we're very pleased to host you. So uh, let's, let's jump into the uh, conversation. And we wanted to uh, ask you about your career first. So what you hosted many What events. career? It's the pandemic. It's the pandemic. <laughs> I don't have a career, bro. <laughs> like in the, what, my career of being homeless? My parents no, were right. My bubble was right. I should have become a doctor. Like, I should have become a doctor. We should all be doctors. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to point out to that later. But like, so just to start, what made you interested in pursuing comedy? So what made me like comedy was actually watching a comedian on television and seeing someone who was able to make people laugh and was having a good time and still kind of teaching people and reaching to people's uh, minds. And I really like that. So going through all this education that I went through, I decided to go into comedy and hopefully be able to be a bridge between two groups of people, Iranians and uh, African-Americans, the Middle Eastern community and the American community uh between muslims and jews just like a whole bridge between all these different groups of people and i thought comedy was the best way that i could do that and it's it's, and it's very great that you mentioned your education because the interesting thing that about you is that you studied some a, a different subject and pursued a different subject as your career and you got your law from georgetown which is like one of the toughest things to do so what, what made you to choose this shift? Like, because there are many people who, who, are, who study something, but maybe ha they have a different passion and they're afraid to pursue it. So how, what made you do, do this shift or decide to have this shift? Well, that's the thing. And I say this because you guys are like young, you guys are both college, right? You're yes. both like college and you're trying to figure it out. If you're going to school to get an education, to get a job, well, that's okay. But just realize that you're getting a job. You said it yourself when you said pursue your passion. Whatever that passion is, pursue it. And at sometimes, oftentimes you throw caution to the wind. But you have to realize that the payoff is even more than anything else right so when you reach your passion when you reach that goal when you uh basically get to your life stream that's worth every bit of hardship that you've ever experienced on your way there and that's why we praise people who follow their passions and follow their destiny as a as as a society we we erect statues to them right there's no statue to a production manager it's, that's just not a that there's no statue to that guy so we, we recognize the value of someone who has put it all on, their, all on the line to get to ultimately what they want. Now, I'm not saying that's for everybody. If your passion is staying at home and laying in bed, well, then you should probably get a job, right? You should probably get a job. But yeah. a lot of people have artistic ambitions. They have business minds, but they, instead they get a job instead of starting their own business. And to me, that's crazy that you're working for someone else for $20 an hour when you could be working for yourself, even if you're only making 10, at least you're working for yourself. It's for you. And I always say that I cultivate, especially to young, uh, young Iranians. I always tell them because Iranian parents often, they want you to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. That's the exactly. three things. They know. That's, true. That's what they know. They know doctor, lawyer, engineer, because you'll always have a job 
and or a dentist. You could become a dentist, sure. <laughs> and if you're not so smart, chiropractor, whatever. The point is, you go into these fields and you work because they know you'll always have a job and people will respect you. But at the same time, they don't realize the value of things like following your dreams, pursuing your passion, um, happiness, where you're literally, you wake up happy doing what you do. And the best way, the best way to show them is through success. So if you are saying you want to become a chef and your parents are against it, if you become an extremely successful chef, they will be for it, but you have to prove it to them. And more importantly, you have to prove it to yourself. A lot of times what, what people do is they just say they want something. They say, oh, I want to be a rapper. Oh, and then you ask them, oh, well, have you done any music? No. Do you have any beats? No. Do you have a website? No. Do you have, uh, did you practice using the mic? No. Do you know how to use uh, engineering software? No. Do you have a SoundCloud? No then you don't want to be a rapper. You just wish you were a rapper. You wish there was a genie. You rub this lamp and become a rapper. That's not how it works. Everything is a lot of hard work. Even overnight success takes 10 years. Overnight success is a 10-year process. You have put in 10,000 hours into becoming an overnight success, and everyone's like, wow, that was fast. But it's not fast to the person actually doing it. It's a lot of heartbreak and rejection and failure and doing it over and over again. So... I'm always about cultivating your craft, pursuing your passion, following your dreams, but doing it in the way where it's not just a wish. You make a plan and it becomes a goal. And I wanted to say major props to you because you, men you mentioned the Iranian parents, Iranian typical parents says, yeah, and I did become a doctor, engineer, or lawyer, or, or even dentist, as you mentioned. How did you... Did how did your dad react? Because you're, you're a dad's person. And how did he react? And did you have to show him that you can become great at something else? A hundred percent. So my, my Bubba is, you know, we say Bubba because that's the Persian word for like dad, right? It's not exactly. like redneck uncles like white guys. Like, hey, Bubba. No, it's Bubba. <laughs> and so Bubba, my, my Bubba was... He, he was supportive, but he didn't know how. And he was just, he questioned it until I became successful. And then he became even more proud of it than me. Like sometimes my Bubba is like, oh, this is my son, Ted on. He's a comedian. He's so funny. It's like, Bubba, relax. We're at a funeral. We're at a funeral right now. Can you calm down, Bubba? I don't need you to tell everyone right now. So uh, that's what I mean by success. When you're successful, right? When you're successful, that will ultimately answer everyone's questions. Whenever someone has a question about you, if you're just successful, that answers the question. That's the best answer is I'm successful. Let's not forget people like Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard. There's no parent that thinks it's a good idea to drop out of Harvard to start a computer program. It's like, that doesn't make sense to them. But then now I'm, I'm, I'm sure his parents are very proud that he became Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> It's the same thing. I always use the story of one of my favorite people on the planet. In 1986, this young, young, uh, young boy born, uh, from Philadelphia, born and raised, right? Uh, on the playground where he spent most of his days, he got into an MIT program, got a great SAT score. His parents gave him money to go to college. Instead, he didn't go to college. He took that money with his friend, Jeff, and they made an album. And that person is Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff. You know him now as Will Smith, right? The actor Will Smith started out a rapper. And in fact, in 1989, he's the first rapper to ever be awarded a Grammy. They didn't even give rap Grammys until Will Smith. Wow. When his parents look at it now... Of course, they're like, my son's Will Smith. They're so happy for Will Smith. They're so proud of Will Smith. But at the time, do you know how, can you even imagine how furious his parents were? His mom who worked so hard and his dad, how upset they had to be that their son dropped out of college to become a rapper when rap wasn't anything and used their money to make an album and, hit, and a hit song called Parents Just Don't Understand. I mean, it didn't make sense to them until 
you see the after effects of success. And so that's why I always say the best, the best solution to everything is success. If you're successful, everyone's questions are answered no matter what. So it doesn't matter if you're successful and you wear clothes like that are like trendy. Think about trendy clothes. Trendy clothes are like ugly clothes. But if you're a successful person and you wear these clothes, everyone's <laughs> like, oh, that's so cool. I <laughs> love when young thug wears dresses or whatever happens, right? So the concept is always success answers everyone's questions. So if you have a passion, cultivate that passion, work hard towards that passion and become successful. And that way, everyone's going to be proud of you, including yourself. Cause, cause also, as you mentioned, like when, if someone now says to their parents, like mom or dad, Bubba June, look at Mark Zuckerberg. And they would, they would say, oh, he was Mark Zuckerberg. That's like one example. Exactly. Or like even Will Smith is one example. And either the, the parent doesn't understand or the student can ex express themselves correctly to just show their passion for that subject, that whatever they want to pursue. That was, like, that was a um, great point that you mentioned too. So... And uh, Tanja, you uh, grew up in the East Coast and yeah, I'm from moved, Washington DC and moved to Los Angeles. So what's so what's the difference between the two cities and cultures? You notice a lot of difference when you move here, right? LA is a lot more laid back. People are except when they're driving. When they're driving, they're mean. But in general, people do things like follow their dreams here. Also, LA is more uh, a relaxed atmosphere. DC is very hustle and bustle. People are much more, I don't want to say educated, but they're much more culturally aware in Washington, DC, because you're around all these different cultures. Now, in LA, it's very diverse, but everyone's very segregated in LA. For example, when I say Beverly Hills, you know it's all the Persians. When I say Glendale, you know it's Armenians. When I say East, East LA, you know it's Latin X. When I say Compton, you know it's black. Uh, when you know every different area has its own different groups of people. When I say Pico and Robertson, you know it's Jewish. Like every group is segregated from each other. But in DC, everyone's mixed. And so you learn a lot about different cultures and different types of people all together because there is no segregation. It's very small in area. So everyone's packed into this one place and everyone just has to figure it out. And also the things that people find important is different. Like even the news in DC is all about politics. And then the news in LA, even though recently, of course, with everything has been about politics, but it's still more about entertainment. Like, it'll be like, President Trump said this, let's find out what Angelina Jolie thinks about it. <laughs> like, I don't- Exactly. I don't, hey. You know, so it's just different. It's different groups of people. And we even have two different groups of uh, Persians that came, so there's a, a lot of people don't realize that after LA, Washington DC has the second largest diaspora of Iranian Americans really? in the United States. Exactly. Wow. And it's actually noticeable. Of course, LA is twice as many, maybe even three times as many in LA. It's just a lot in LA. Like Los Angeles, right? Exactly. But in, in Washington DC, you know, we, we don't have Tehran Jalez, but we do have Tehran Corner, which is Tyson's Corner. It's like Tehran Corner. It's just a lot of Iranians. A uh, very nice affluent area. So, so you get these uh, Iranians that go to Washington, D.C. They were there, like a lot of them are very political. A lot of them are very educated professors, engineers. They went there for specifically for school and then were stuck there during the revolution. And then they uh, created that atmosphere. And in L.A., you get these Iranians who left during and after the revolution who came to LA to get away from the revolution. And they exactly. have, so most of them have a lot of money or if they didn't bring money with them, they at least had a lot of money in Iran. So they knew how to make more money when they were here and they're very wealthy here. So you get these two different groups of Iranians and they act, they act different. It's very interesting to watch how it works, but I love how LA is. LA has treated me very well, so I cannot complain. Uh, and for my career choice, LA is the place to be. In Washington, D.C., I would have been, been a lawyer. In L.A., 
in Los Angeles, I can be an international comedian, right? And that's why I'm here. Exactly. And then, uh, good to know, because I, I thought like New York or San Francisco has the second largest Iranian population. It's the misconception. So you came to LA and then um, you, you perform at the diff different venues, but mostly Laugh Factory, is that correct? Yeah, Laugh Factory is actually a perfect example of, first of all, a lot of people don't realize the owner of the Laugh Factory is Jamie Masada, who is an Iranian American. Fled Iran, lived in Israel, and then came to the United States, comes to the United States, and um, as, as, a, as a kid, he's basically 16 in, in the United States by himself. At the age of 17, He's trying to be a comedian and his parents, you know, also had a hard time approving it. So by 18, he bought the Laugh Factory with all the money he had saved up. He put down a, a small deposit and decided to make it work. And 40 years later, the Laugh Factory is giving me another Iranian American, half Iranian, half black, like giving me an opportunity to showcase my talent for the world. So that's how the cycle goes about helping people when you follow your passions jamie followed his passion in comedy and then opened created a business that gave other people like myself maz Rabani, max amini amir k gave us opportunities melissa shoshahi gave us opportunities to perform comedy you know and so that's why it's it's a spectacular cycle that's why i tell people i'm not saying don't become a doctor lawyer engineer i'm saying do it if you want to do it. Do it if you truly want to do it. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be the one waking up and going to work. So yes, your parents, obviously, they want what's best for you. And to them, that's what's best. But sometimes we know what's best for us too. We just have to prove it, not only to them, but to ourselves. So the... As you mentioned, the love factory. Yusef, Yusef, Khairi Haf Mizani. No, no, no. You speak so much. Can you please stop talking? You're interrupting Daria all the time. I'm kidding, because Yusef hasn't spoken one time. He hasn't I know. We, so, we, so we like lay, laid out and, and thought about how to like ask questions and talk so it's not like i'm taking all the time you said <laughs> jump if I'm like... what? even something like this right you guys just doing a podcast right you, it's just something you're doing and it's fun and you enjoy it but right now someone could watch one of your podcasts someone could watch this podcast and someone's like oh man i've always wanted to do comedy i'm gonna do comedy and that person becomes the next dave Chappelle's some kid or, or a kid is like, oh, I want to do comedy and looks at me and is like, oh, I don't want to be that guy. I'm never going to do comedy. Becomes a doctor and cures cancer. That's how little things all have big effects. And so this is a ripple right now. And you guys don't even realize you're creating and doing something. Uh, there's another group of Persian kids who are going to be like, man, they have a podcast. I want to do a podcast. That's how it works. It's That's a ripple why effect. It's important. Exactly. Okay. So you have to. So, <laughs> As you mentioned, the Laugh Factory. Tell us about where did you get inspiration for your jokes and who's your favorite comedian? All right. So the inspiration I get from my jokes are my thoughts, right? I observe the world all the time. I'm always just taking in the world. And I come up with these ideas a lot. That's the first place. The second place is my personal experiences. Sure, on the outside, I look American or I look black, but on the inside, all of us, including both of you who are here, we're all mixed. We all have Iranian and American uh, cultural mixes and heritage in us, whether it's genetic or just by definition. And so I speak from that experience, which is why such an amazing group of young people like you guys, you guys can relate to what I'm saying because you heard the same things and you've been through the same things like when i tell you my bubba wanted me to be a doctor lawyer engineer you guys understand that because your bubba wants you to be a doctor lawyer engineer so i talk about those experiences and i express this to all types of people not just other iranian people and then they get a better understanding of iranians and then thirdly um my my inspiration for my jokes 
really comes from things that I see. So on the first hand, it's my thoughts. My second is like my experience. But the third is my observation. Just literally, I see something that's funny and I talk about it and it works. My favorite comedians, my favorite comedian, my personal all-time favorite is Dave Chappelle. I just love brilliant comedy and I think he's brilliant. Uh, good comedy makes you laugh, but great comedy makes you think. And therefore, this great comedy where he just makes you think. But then I really like Max Amini and Maz Jabrani. Maz is like, they're both like big brothers to me and they've helped me so much. But they've also created a space for Iranian comedians and Iranian American comedians in the mainstream market. Uh, and then finally, it's going to be people like Tiffany Haddish, who is like my sister and she's just so, her energy is always amazing. So I like, these are the people that I look up to as, as, com as comedy legends, you know? So what are the difference between Iranian and American audience? I mean, the jokes you have, you use. Say Iranian. You're Iranian, Iranian. say Iranian. I've always Iranian. Heard, yeah, I Iranian to say Iranian because that's how Americans say it. I'm like, why? Say Iranians. Iranian. Exactly. You say Iranian, they will learn how to say Iranian. Iranians. What sure. are the difference between Iranians and Americans? audience i mean the jokes that you use like this lawyer engineer and doctor are these jokes funny for americans as well or not just iranian iranians iranians so <laughs> my jokes are actually you know the way i present it it translates well to the audience because i have the advantage of also looking and being half american completely so they can understand and i relate it to them so whenever you tell a story, and I'll tell you an example, when George Lopez, who is an amazing comedian, and he is Latinx, he's Mexican, when he tells a story, or he tells a joke, you're Iranian, but you still understand it. And it's very funny. It's the same thing, except there hasn't been an Iranians so much in, uh, in the forefront or on stage to get our stories out there as well. That's why, even though a lot of Iranians dislike or they pretend to not like Shahs of Sunset. Shahs of Sunset has made Iranians more popular in the United States. Like more Americans are always like, oh, Shahs of Sunset. They love Shahs of Sunset because they like seeing people. And, and it's not that they think all Iranians are like that. They just like seeing Iranians. And then they start getting acclimated and used to them. And so that's how it works. So the audience, to me, the audience, it doesn't matter what background they are they can understand my humor. Now, there is a difference between Iranian audiences and American audiences. Iranian audiences are much more difficult, right? So they don't laugh as easy. So when yeah. you tell jokes, they don't laugh as easy. Sometimes they can get uncomfortable. There are certain things that are taboo in Iranian culture that Americans can go up and talk about all the time. Americans can take a girl home and be like, hey, mom, hey, dad, this is my girlfriend, Kelly, uh, and start kissing her in front of her parents. Like, I would never do that. It's culturally different. <laughs> like, even if I was getting married and the pastor was like, you may now kiss the bride, I'm going to give my wife a high five in front of my bubba. Like, I'm not going to kiss in front of my parents. Like, bubba, <laughs> me just, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what, what are we kissing? We're not kissing. So that's what I mean. It's like, it's, it's different. It's just a different concept. And we, so you understand that, but because you're Persian, you know these cultural differences and that's just a part of who I am. I'm not trying to be something, I am this. And so it shows. When you, when you point out that the Iranian audience are difficult compared to the American audience, have you ever experienced a time where, where like you tell a joke and suddenly like no one laughs or how has that, if yes, has that like affected your confidence, Chijuri? Like, how have you overcome it and then regained oh, the confidence? That has definitely happened, but ironically, with an American audience. Okay, so <laughs> so Iranian audiences are as difficult as they can be because you have certain things that they understand. It works, but when you start telling a joke, the joke isn't funny when you always from the beginning. It's kind of like taking a piece of stone and you're chiseling it out to make a statue, right? It, it, make it into art. 
So sometimes when you tell a joke in the beginning on stage for the first time or second time, it's not funny to the audience. But as a comedian, you know there's something there. There's actually a joke that I have that the first time I told it, I got booed. I got booed for saying it. Like someone was like, boo. Like people were like, duh. Now when I say it, it's a standing ovation. People die <laughs> laughing. That's what I'm saying. You have to, you have to um, work on it. And that's the only thing with anything you do, practice makes perfect. No matter who you are, no matter what you do. If you play basketball, dribble the ball until you're perfect. Shoot the ball until you're perfect. If you do computer programming, program until you're perfect practice makes perfect there is no shortcut to success the harder you work the better you are the harder you work the luckier you are there is no there is no secret secret code or shortcut to get ahead and so like, yeah yeah that's what I mean. they say like overnight success doesn't happen right overnight success isn't real overnight success if it does happen That just means you'll be an overnight failure the next night. So if you become <laughs> successful too fast, it's just like a candle. If a candle burns too bright, too fast, it burns out quick. So because you haven't earned it, uh, it becomes nothing. It's like kind of if, if you got superpowers all of a sudden, you could fly. You shouldn't, you should be afraid because what if you were in the air and your powers just left because you didn't earn it to begin with. So if they just left, you can't say anything. You just fall out of the sky. It's the same thing. It's like if you didn't earn your success, you will lose it very quickly because you never learned the skills necessary to sustain them. So tell them, just so now it that we... It happens, by the way. It happens to a lot, especially in music and art. It happens a lot where someone puts out a one hit. That's when you hear about the one hit wonder. That means they didn't earn it, just to let you know. What were you going to say, Daria? So I was going to ask you, so since now we're in um, COVID, and then you, you pointed out at the beginning of the conversation, what have you been doing in the past few months? How has that affected you? Are there new hobbies that you've been doing? Well, I have a new hobby, OnlyFans. I, I'm on OnlyFans now, trying to make money. There's not, I mean, I've been doing Zoom shows. I've been doing drive-in shows actually in oc you're in oc i've gone to the improv the um uh irvine improv several times and done shows with cars cars line up full car parking lot 400 cars you know probably like a thousand people and i'm on stage and there's a movie screen behind me and they watch and listen in their cars that's how it works that's how was how, how was the how was the experience It was very different because it's a comedian. When we go on stage, it's like a singer. A singer has a band or backup singers or whatever. That's their accompaniment for, for their music is their accompaniment for a singer. For us, our music is the laughter and the audience being there and we can feel that energy. And without that being there, it's been very different and very difficult on zoom it's very interesting you there are people on the screens and you have to just change uh, and and get used to it you have to adapt but like anything anytime you're making a move towards the basket you don't you don't stop you pivot and change and make the best play possible so it's very similar it's very similar so we just had to make the best out of it we're all going through this together It's a tough time. So, Teranjo, when, when Yusuf and I started this podcast, the main reason was that when COVID started, we ourselves and a lot of our friends, they were like, we all became a bit depressed and didn't know what to do. And, and when we called each other or our friends, everyone sounded hopeless. So my question to you is that uh, can you give – us an advice in terms of how to deal with this if we're feeling unproductive hopeless or people don't know what to do or what's it going to happen yeah of course um buy toilet paper apparently that solves <laughs> problems. if you just buy toilet paper you'll be fine. That's all you need to do is go buy. If you have to fight someone in the store for toilet paper, just fight them. Just, just beat up the person, stab them, 
get that toilet paper and your life will be fine. It, it's interesting. We look at the pandemic as if it's the end, but it's not. It's actually a chance for opportunity. We see that the world's billionaires have made $1.9 trillion in the last uh, six months. So what's Mashallah. the difference us, right? I mean, yeah, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, that just means that we get stimulus checks and give it straight to them. So the concept is we are in this situation. This is the, it's the best of times. It's the worst of times. This is the most interesting time to be alive. This is when you can do all the planning you want and get ready. So when everything is back on track, you're ready. This is the time where all of us could have taken the time to work out at home. And then when we went back out in the world, we would all be built and have six packs and muscles. But we didn't do that. That's our fault, not the pandemic. What we learned from the pandemic is to say, stay self-motivated and to help motivate others the way you, uh, Daria, and Yousef did by starting this podcast. is just motivate others, right? You guys started a podcast. Who knows what happens from this? You could do anything. You could take this time to write stuff. You can study more. How many people are like, oh, I'm going to put off school, but they aren't taking the time to study to get ahead. Nothing stops us from doing that. Nothing stops us from our success except for us, ourselves, and systemic racism, but that's a different conversation, right? But the concept is nothing stops us from success but us. So we can do and use this time very productively. And I remember when it first started, everybody was planning on doing that, and yet most of us did not. So use this time. Get, get motivated. Figure out what you want to do. Figure out who you are as a person. Figure out who you want to be and start planning. And don't just talk about it. Be about it. Write a, write a plan uh, one week, one month, three months, six months, one year. Where do I want to be? I want to get to this. How do I get to these steps to get here? And map that out for yourself, and you will see how actually exciting this pandemic can be. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm sure, like, yourself, I, and our audience will, will s stick that to their mind and try to go forward with it. So uh, before the conclusion, we wanted to play a, a short game with you in terms of, like, asking you questions about like like food music and those kind of stuff so uh, yusuf you start yeah i wanted to ask as half iranian person what's your favorite dishes persian dishes warma sabzi hands down beautiful everyone beautiful. if you don't like warma sabzi you're a bad person you know who didn't like warma sabzi charles manson uh hitler <laughs> like these people do not like warma sabzi, warma sabzi is yeah. amazing do you understand nice, warma yes. sabzi is amazing the best dish ever. And so who is your favorite Iranian musician? My favorite Iranian musician? Okay, I like the classics. So I like Gugush and Gugush and Ebi Daryush. My favorites are going to be vegan and uh, it's got to be, it's going to have to be vegan maybe. Haide. Haide is my favorite Persian okay. artist. I just have so okay. many. It depends. I like Sussy Moncam. Like, I like, <laughs> you know? So they're good. Okay, so let me ask you one question. You watch Iran Iranian films? I, films? Uh, yeah, I've watched my favorite Iranian movie of all time, Doz de Arusaka. Have you ever seen it? Okay, movie? yes. yes. Uh -huh, nane, man, Yo, that <laughs> yes. movie was a classic. And uh, Sultan Galba. Like, I, I watch random movies, but not as much as, uh, not the ones now. Um, what, what's the series, Daijan Napolon? That was very, yes. that was brilliant. Yeah. San Francisco. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Funny. But yeah, that's the thing. Okay. For Daijan Napolon. Okay, and the last one I want to ask, now you live in LA and lots of, Persian holiday and celebrations. What's your favorite Persian holiday? Like hey, listen, let's be honest. Yalda, Shabi Yalda, no one used to do Shabi Yalda. That became popular now. Like we didn't do Shabi Yalda always, right? It was like it became more popular as we, we started 
like میخواستیم فرهنگ خودمون رو حفظ باشیم گفتیم شب یلدا هم مهمه and it's an amazing one everyone شب یلدا if it wasn't for fall hafiz no one cares about شب یلدا no one just eats fruit and anar off the top we just want to know our 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 fortune so we love شب یلدا right or like mehrgan mehrgan they used to have a big um in orange county they used to have a big celebration that was made mehrgan amazing But the only real Persian holiday is Nowruz. We all know it, okay? Because Nowruz is like, it start, once it hits, it's amazing. You have Char Shambhasuri, you get Nowruz, and then you get Sizdim Adar. Boom, boom, boom. And you get the best parties, the best uh, events, and the best everything. So that's why it's my favorite. Beautiful. And then the half seen. And then you have to have the half seen. Half seen, I guess, but she ain't really okay? But you have to have your half seen. Yeah, especially with the fish, with the fish and the colored yeah. eggs. And the, and the best part is no one even knows what all half seen are, right? Everyone just knows, like, everyone knows, like, five. And then the other two, we're like, uh, Seep Zabini. Like, we just make up stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, they just make, um, uh, yeah, they just make up. They're like salad. Like they just salad seems amazing. Everyone just has five. Like we have five, and then they can't agree on the other ones because there's so many. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Tenonjun, we wanted to thank you again for um, giving us this opportunity to have this conversation with you. It was a great pleasure hosting you, and um, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, Yusufjan, do you want to say something? Thank you very much, Tehran. It was good to talk to you and our dear audience. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow our Instagram page, and share this video with your friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching until the end of this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow our Instagram page and share this video with your friends. Also, if you have extra time, please check out our other videos. Thank you and see you next time.